Good morning and welcome to City. I want to thank the Foundation Center, the New York Regional Association of Grantmakers, United Way of New York City, and all the other organizations who helped organize this timely event. We're in a critical time, faced with very serious challenges, and the only way that we're going to get past them is to think our way out. That's a collaborative exercise, and I'm very glad to be here with you and the people and the organizations who have been making positive change happen in our New York communities to talk about how we're going to continue to succeed in doing that. The people you serve are the ones who get hit first and hardest, even when there's a mild economic downturn. Today, we have what you would call a perfect storm of economic bad news, a housing emergency with skyrocketing foreclosure rates and tanking property values, unemployment rates higher than they've been in a decade and continuing to climb, consumer confidence at a 16-year low, Credit markets are freezing up. New York City is hurting as other cities. And uh, as unemployment grows and businesses sh shrink or go under, tax revenues disappear, which means cut in government programs and services. <clears throat> Luckily, the nonprofit sector is on the scene to deal with gaps or increases in needs. And I, and I call the uh, nonprofits, I've been calling them recently, first responders especially when there's a crisis. Unfortunately, these same community organizations aren't immune to the economic turmoil. It costs more to do things, and fundraising becomes more difficult. We know the government's going to be on the case in some areas, and we can look forward to some big changes. We're about to witness a monumental, historic transition in the country. In two months, will inaugurate the nation's first African-American president and a full Democratic majority will be seated in Congress. <laughs> Frankly, it seems that the first 100 days have already started for Barack Obama, and it will be, <laughs> and it will be solely focused on turning the economy around, as my guess. We do expect, though, that there will be greater regulation for the financial services industry. You've probably noticed that against the backdrop of sudden, unprecedented taxpayer involvement in our industry, the spotlight is on us pretty tightly right now. We don't expect that to change anytime soon. The financial services industry is under a microscope and regulatory and political expectations are raised. The Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, is on the table for reexamination in 2009. CRA guides much of our community work here at City, and it ensures that financial institutions will meet the needs of the communities in which they operate, in broad terms including service, lending, and investment in low-income communities. That translates in practical terms to the many hundreds of partnerships that City has with local nonprofit community organizations around the country, including almost 350 organizations here in New York. We're committed to continuing our work together with these organizations during the current crisis and beyond. Our very strong top management team has concentrated on maintaining our strength and stability. While the current environment is difficult, we're ending the year in a much stronger position than we entered in terms of capital, liquidity, and competitive position. We have been successful in reducing our expenses. I know you've heard a lot about that this week. And reducing our risky assets while maintaining our commitment to providing our clients and communities with outstanding service and support. I am pessimistic for our future, and that will have enough earning power to see us through the continued global economic downturn and the higher credit losses that that would imply. City never sleeps, and we are committed to serving our communities with focus and energy. That commitment involves staying closely involved with our community partners, not just in terms of our support and our involvement in their work, but also an ongoing dialogue and discussion. We look forward to continuing to work with our partners, but again, we want to encourage you to work together as well. Share information, resources, and expertise. Their strength in numbers and our communities count on their first responders to be, to be strong. So thanks for coming today and thanks for allowing us to be part of the process and part of the solution. I, 
I also want to put a plug uh, into all of the people who uh, are behind the scenes at City who did so much to make this event possible, our audiovisual guys and uh, you know, all of the, the team that worked so hard on this. Uh, and now what I would like to do is turn it over to uh, Brad Smith, the uh, president of the Foundation Center. Brad? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank you for hosting us here at City. Uh, my name is Brad Smith. I'm the president of the Foundation Center. Um, for, I arrived six weeks ago here um, in the middle of this storm, and it's been quite a ride. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank our co-sponsors of this event, uh, the New York Regional Associ Association of Grant Makers and uh, United Way of New York City. Um, as a storm demands, this event was put together with a lot of speed and a lot of hard work, and there's a cast of thousands, literally, that uh, put this together. Uh, last week, I was at the United Nations uh, for the annual meeting of the Advisory Board on Human Security. Uh, the concept of human security was born 10 years ago when the world was plunged into chaos by the collapse of the Asian financial markets. Uh, countries that seemed to be doing everything right, they were opening their markets, their economies were growing, uh, suddenly cascaded into a violent recession and literally millions of people in Asia fell through very tattered social safety nets. In the wake of this crisis, uh, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, convened a high-level commission uh, to study whether or not a paradigm shift was needed for how the world dealt with downturns. This commission was chaired by Sagato Gata, who was then the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, as well as Nobel Prize-winning economist Amartya Sen. What they came, came up with was a very special report called Human Security Now. It defines the goal of human security, and I quote, to protect the vital core of all human lives in ways that enhance human freedoms and human fulfillment. Human security means protecting people from critical and pervasive threats. It means using processes that build on people's strengths and their aspirations. It means creating political, social, environmental, economic, military, and cultural systems that together give people the building blocks of survival, livelihood, and dignity. Today we find ourselves facing a crisis that started with risky mortgages in the United States and is snowballed into a global recession the depths of which we have not even begun to discern. The finger pointing is well underway and the purpose of this event is not to contribute to that. In truth, we all share responsibility. Uh, as Gera LaMarche, the president of Atlantic Philanthropies here in New York, said in an October 15th speech, we have largely failed to articulate a broad and inclusive social vision that works toward the world as we would like it to be. We have often lost the gifts of collaboration and common purpose with others who share our greater value. And it is in that spirit that we gather here today to bridge the divides between government, business, nonprofits, and foundations, to find, a way that, to find a way that we can fulfill the promise of human security, to both protect and empower people so that they enjoy freedom from fear, freedom from want, and the freedom to live in dignity. Our keynote speaker today is Jeffrey Canada. Um, I may be the only person in this room that, had the, that knows Jeffrey Canada from Switzerland. I didn't meet him in New York. I met him in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, of all places, where he had traveled to address uh, the trustees of a family foundation that supports the work, uh, his work in Harlem. Since 1990, Jeff has been the president and chief executive officer of Harlem Children's Zone. Uh, the genius of Harlem Children's Zone is to work with families from the time their children are born until they make it successfully through college. It takes a long-term view in a part of New York where many people just struggle to make it through the day. And whether Kofi Annan ever sent Jeff his report on human security, Jeff probably didn't need it. Um, he's been practicing it all along, and it's people like him that will help get us out of this crisis. Jeff?
Good morning. So now you know that I will travel all over the world uh, for the right amount of money. I will go there. Do not worry. Uh, how's everybody doing? So can I, can I start off telling you uh, my political acumen has actually grown over the last uh, eight years. Some of you know that uh, very early on I made the one political prediction in all the years. I've been in the same job for 25 years, right? So I never get involved in local politics or anything else because I have to protect the agency. And about eight years ago, uh, my good friend Mark Green was running for mayor. And I'd never, ever, ever done anything because I had to protect the agency. And it was like two weeks before the election and Mark was up like 15 points. And I said, you know what? I'm pretty smart. I'm going to go and back him. Don't tell the mayor, please, Linda, all right? That was, that was pretty dumb. So I got this call a year ago, and they said, uh, look, uh, the senator is interested in uh, doing uh, Harlem Children's Zones across America. And this is before the primaries, before Super Tuesday. And I said, Senator who? Uh, and they said, Barack Obama. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, let's see. Got to get past Super Tuesday. Got to get past the Clintons. I, uh, look, I'm, tell him, you know, that uh, I'd love to go with him to Washington to do this, but I'm busy. <laughs> so he did it on his own. <laughs> I saw the tape. Uh, it wasn't the smartest thing I've done. Uh, so I'm hoping that he doesn't remember that either. Uh, so I'm 0 for 2 here uh, with uh, my predictions. But here's something that uh, I am sure of. Uh, many of us watched what happened uh, to New Orleans uh, with uh, the Katrina. And some of us were stunned by the fact that our government did nothing and it seemed like everybody who could have done something did nothing. Uh, and, you know, later on when they began to uh, sort of talk about what had happened, uh, you listen to people say how they did not know. They didn't know how I didn't know them. The feds were saying they didn't know and everybody was saying, but when I was sitting there and I look, I'm not too plugged in, but I do watch the Weather Channel, right? <laughs> and for three days, they had been saying potentially the worst storm in the last 100 years was heading directly for New Orleans. And I was watching this for three days, and I said to myself, what are they talking about? They saw this thing coming. It was there. Why did they do nothing? And so, you know, Katrina has been one of the things that people talk about, the failure of government and some of the other things. Well, I've been watching this storm coming. Uh, and, you know, I think the shocking thing about Katrina was that even though uh, people finally sort of knew this was an emergency, some people were too poor to get out of the way of a storm that would kill them. Uh, I think that for those of us in this room, we're going to face our own Katrina uh, challenge. You've got some people who are going to really suffer, people who I'm calling the new poor, people who had good jobs, they were making money, and now they have lost their jobs. Uh, there is no uh, place for them to go to now get a job, and they are not used to being poor. Uh, and the challenge that we face is that that number is going to increase dramatically. Uh, and then there's, there's what I call the old poor. You know, many of us got our statements uh, in um, September and were shocked by what happened to our 401Ks, right? We just looked at it and said, oh, my goodness. Uh, this group I'm talking about, the old poor, there are no 401Ks. Uh, there's no safety net. Uh, there is nothing near. Uh, they're trying to figure out how I can get, uh, you know, uh, uh, transportation money uh, to make it to work or lunch money. Uh, there is no savings. There's nothing there. And here's the challenge we're going to face. 
high. If you were reading the New York Times, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, you had a picture of the Depression, on, and, and it was right on the front page. I think it was on the business section. And if you looked at the picture, what you saw, and I showed it to my, to my children. I said, yeah, come here. I said, look at this picture. What do you see? And they looked, and it was a long line of people going all around. You could just see as far as. I said, well, what is it? About? They said, it was a long line of people. I said, what is They said, oh, it's all men. I said, no, no, look closely. What else is there? They said, oh, it's all white men. I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when people think about this crisis, they're thinking about how many jobs we're going to lose. They're thinking about what happens to Wall Street. They're thinking about the economic engines. And it's easy to forget there is a whole group of other people, which if this group is in trouble, this group here, this is life or death. And I'm saying people are going to die. Uh, I'm not exaggerating what's going to happen. Uh, and because of the crisis, and it is a real crisis, it's not like those people were lined up because they weren't in crisis. They were in crisis, and people were trying to figure out how to respond to them. Uh, there are certain of our communities uh, that are going to move uh, post-crisis. I don't know what comes after crisis uh, when work disappears for everybody. Uh, and somehow we've got to figure out how to handle the new crisis and not lose sight of the old crisis. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, and I think that we've got to meet that challenge. You know, uh, I had to do something uh, two weeks ago I've never done in the 25 years I've been at the agency. Uh, I actually had uh, to lay people off. Worst thing imaginable. Uh, in the midst of a recession. Right? I know those people I've laid off. I know they're not getting jobs. This is not something like, well, you know, I, I hope you're going to. This is, uh, I think, going to be repeated all over uh, our city uh, because New York City, you know, if the rest of the country is in trouble, New York City is ground zero. Uh, when you think about what kind of tax revenues we receive uh, from Wall Street and our financial center and what's happening to that industry, uh, it is unbelievable right now what's going to happen. Uh, but we had to do the layoffs because uh, I think I know what's coming. Uh, and if we are not able to provide real services to our children and families in Central Harlem, I know people are going to die. Uh, and so it wasn't something I wanted to do. Uh, it's not something I had ever done before. Uh, but this is about figuring out a way for us to make sure we hold together that safety net for the next two years. This is not going to be a two month or three. We're talking a couple of real hard years. And if we do what the folks did when Katrina was coming and just stick our heads in the sand, not prepare ourselves for what's coming, uh, and then end up uh, scrambling and losing, uh, I think, much more than we would have if we had been smart about this. This would be a problem. You know. Uh, one of the things I notice in this room is so many people that I've worked with over the years, uh, and few of you as, are as old as I am, uh, but some of you have some years in this business. Uh, and this is a time, this is a time when leadership matters. This is a time when, you know, people don't want to do the tough thing right now. People don't want to make the tough decisions. People don't want to prioritize. People don't want to have to really focus and deal with, I think, how we as the leadership in this city have to save New York City. There's nobody else going to, this is going to really be on us. We're going to have to make sure New York doesn't become what it once was. You know, some of you were here uh, in the 80s. Some of you were here during the fiscal crisis. Some of you were here when New York City was a dirty place with the homeless people all over everywhere and crime and murder was out of control. The streets were unsafe. No one wanted to be here. The city is in a totally different place today, and we can't go back to the old days. And that means we've got to protect the infrastructure of our city, and that has to happen across the entire city. And we cannot allow this city to get focused on one part of its citizens and not on the other. Now, we don't have to convince our mayor of this. Uh, that I'm sure. Uh, but we're going to have to make some tough choices. Uh, and I think that uh, part of the reason we're here today uh, is that even though we know, we know what's coming, it's not quite here yet. It's coming, 
the, 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 we're going to hit get the state budget and we're going to get the city budget and those cuts are going to happen and the layoffs are going to start piling up. It's coming, uh, but we've got a couple of months to prepare ourselves for the next two years. And what we do in this next couple of months is either going to uh, give this city a fighting chance uh, or we're going to watch the decline of this great, great city uh, back to what it was, uh, which I think would be a huge problem. Uh, so, uh, many folks have asked me, you know, Jeff, uh, you going to Washington? So, let me make an announcement now. The answer is no, right? Uh, why? You can't leave the city that you love when it's about to face what it's going to face. Uh, if those of us in this room have a responsibility for communities that are underserved, uh, that we have worked years to try and get those people in those communities the opportunities that uh, our Constitution promises. Uh, our people need us now more than ever. There has never been a time in New York City where I think uh, our expertise is needed. Uh, we've got to be smart, we've got to be tenacious, uh, we've got to be prepared to do the toughest things, but in the end we've got to make sure that opportunity in New York City continues no matter how bad the economic uh, conditions become in this city. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been very frustrated uh, by uh, what I've seen happen at the state level, which seems that, uh, you know, we've got a governor saying, look, we've got to make tough choices, you've got other people saying, well, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just against what you're doing. I'm not going to recommend anything. Uh, and you know what, that's just not leadership. Uh, you, you fine, you don't like what something, propose something different. In the end, uh, I think that we've got to do the tough things. Now, uh, I'm going to say one thing that uh, may be considered somewhat controversial. Uh, I don't think uh, that things need to be as bad as I'm suggesting. Uh, I think in New York City uh, needs a bailout. And, you know, the uh, federal government is the only place right now that really has any money. They're going to they're gonna do deficit spending. It's going to happen. They, they, everybody's afraid of a depression coming, and they've decided, both Republicans and Democrats, the only way we're going to stop that is we've got to spend money. We've got to make sure that money comes into communities and that money gets spent. Now, some people are afraid uh, to get online for the bailout, right? Because they say, well, you know, come on, that's the bailout. No, I'm not afraid at all. Uh, so if you all don't want to get online, I'll get online by myself, right? But I think, I think honestly that in the end, when people talk about infrastructure, they're not thinking about the human infrastructure we have to have so that our children, our young people, and our poorest people can survive. Uh, and every time uh, we invest in these communities, uh, we're making our cities and our state uh, a better place. So I am hoping uh, that when the discussions begin around the federal dollars, that New York City uh, will do, you know, I don't know, who got the arrows in the last bailout? You all know those wooden arrows that got into that? You, you, you all know what I'm talking about, right? In the last bailout, to, to get a vote, they, they allowed someone who makes wooden arrows to get some money. Well, I thought, wooden arrows? What is that? Well, if we can make a case for wooden arrows, I think we can make a case uh, for the uh, precious human service infrastructure in cities like New York. Uh, and I think that there's no reason to have uh, a senator as uh, terrific uh, as Chuck Schumer is. He's a great senator. He's in the leadership, right? We've got a senator who managed to get 18 million votes in America. She's in the leadership, Senator Clinton. Uh, and we've got the head of uh, Ways and Means, uh, Charlie Wangle. Uh, I think we can get the equivalent of wooden arrows from that group. Uh, the question is, uh, what is what is it that 
we are all prepared to do, and this is not about whether a service supports my organization or your organization. This is really talking about a vision of the city that allows the entire city to weather what's going to be, I think, a severe short-term, couple of years, but a severe downturn uh, in a way that allows us to continue the work that we've been doing over the years. So let me, let me just close by saying this. Uh, if this is war, and I think it is, uh, and if I am on the front lines of this war, like those of you are in this room, uh, there's not a better group of people that I want to go to war with than the people right here. Uh, and I'm hoping that we're going to come up with the right plan. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff. That, that was really great. You know, Jeff uh, remarked, uh, he made a remark about uh, 401k, and, and I was having dinner with a friend last night, and she said she'd solved her angst about her 401k by just thinking of it as a 201k. So I guess maybe that's the way to deal with it. But Jeff also mentioned um, human services, and I'm very pleased and proud to be able to present our next speaker, um, Linda Gibbs, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. Um, I think she doesn't need an introduction, but her bio is in your, uh, your material. But she is responsible for the full range of human services, everything from juvenile justice to the Department of the Aging, and has a very long track record in New York uh, working with the homeless. Um, she also oversees the New York, City, uh, New York City Center for Economic Opportunity, and she really is exemplary of the kind of public service uh, that we're all going to need and that Jeff was talking about. So, Linda? Good morning, everybody. So I have that great place on the, uh, on the agenda that nobody wants, which is to follow Jeff Canada. Um, Fred Fields um, said to me this morning, yeah, it's like being after Yogi Berra in the lineup. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, um, but it will always be my honor to follow, um, to follow Jeff. He's a great leader in the city and is someone who um, never, ever says no when you ask him for help um, and when you're trying to think through a tough problem and act through a tough situation. And so, um, so it's really, it really is my honor. Um, and I think that he's really uh, set up, I mean, I'm um, sitting there and um, really thought that he has just a wonderful way of um, laying out the problems in front of us and the challenges and um, thinking about what we really have to do in order to help strengthen our community and um, make us uh, more able, not less able in the days ahead. And um, so I, I completely um, agree with the importance of what he's um, laid out. And maybe what I'll do is to um, try to turn it a little bit more um, to home and to think about what can we do. I mean, we all have to be players in our advocacy for, um, for what needs to happen in Washington. I think we can influence um, what happens and, and how it comes. The mayor has been working very hard advocating um, on behalf of the city for in increases on, just on a little technical level um, in what was the FMAP. Um, which is the Medicaid reimbursement rate, which will bring dollars straight down to the community level through the expenditures for um, some of the most needy households, and in um, investments in the infrastructure, which it does not escape the mayor in the least, that, um, that those investments will bring jobs and, um, into our communities that are desperately needed in the upcoming future. So, um, so that advocacy has to go on. We all have to be part of it. I think what I wanted to, what I thought about as I um, thought about the challenges today is, you know, I spend my time down in the cubicle in the bullpen um, thinking about what can we do, what do we need to do, urgently act on now in order to be ready, not in six months, but in six days perhaps, in six hours, in six weeks, in the immediate future of people who are going to meet, meet our services and need the highest quality, best performing services we can possibly have in the immediate future. And so, um, and, you know, the things that I worry about, Jeff mentioned, the loss of charitable funding. Um, I've heard from some CEOs who had to cancel their annual fundraisers because banks had um, unfortunately had to pull out their funding. And, um, and, of course, I know about the decreases in city funds. I worry a lot about what's going to happen at the state level. The dollars there, the magnitude of those gaps in the budget are just um, overwhelming. And... Um, 
And while I'm hopeful about this president's commitment to um, helping urban centers and, um, and the needy, I think it's not something that we can count on in the next five minutes. And so I think that what that means is that we all have to really work hard um, together uh, to do our best to think about how we can take the resources we have and the circumstances we have and organize ourselves so that we can protect um, those core safety net services. So, um, and I, this is, you know, I, so two, and the themes here, you know, I'm not going to talk about programs and services. We, um, there's plenty of forms to do that. So what I thought about was a little bit about, you know, what is going to be necessary in, in order to strengthen the sector, in order to strengthen our nonprofit community, in order to best enable us to um, serve those in need. And so, first, maybe just talking honestly about our approach to the city budget. Um, <clears throat> One of the things I instructed the commissioners um, of the, the social service agencies, health human services, which includes our correctional services and rehabilitative services, is that when they had to approach the cuts to their budget, I didn't want them to just take an across-the-board cut. A lot of times, across-the-board cuts, let's just spread a little bit all over the place. Everybody takes a 5% cut. Everybody takes a 10% cut. I didn't want to pretend that that didn't have a really significant impact on the sector and I actually believe that it, what, what it does is it over time gradually just diminishes and diminishes and diminishes the foundation so that we're not on a strong foundation, um, but we're sitting on a pile of sand. And I didn't want to go forward pretending that that was a wise way to approach these budget decisions. So I asked the commissioners to make very targeted and focused cuts in their agencies. And this leads to tough decisions. Sometimes this means complete program eliminations. Sometimes it means a significant reduction in a service. But what it does is it makes sure that the core services that we have to protect are really protected, preserved, and, I hope, strengthened. But it's tough choices. I can make those tough choices when I need to. I know it's going to be hard. And um, I know part of the consequence of that, I've sort of gotten used to sometimes seeing my face on um, posters at protests, but I think it's a kind of tough decision that really has to be made if we're serious about making sure that our core services are strong. Another thing that we're really focused on that many of you have been participating in in some fashion, I hope, is our commitment to um, continue to provide the cost of living adjustments to the um, social services sector. This is um, something that um, we don't have the kind of unionized workforce um, uniformly um, that the city government has to, um, to advance the salaries of the city workers. And so over time, our social service workers' um, wages have, have dropped, and in real terms may have even dropped. And I believe that we need to focus part of the strategy of making sure our sector is strong is that we focus on making sure that our frontline workers have the resources and have our commitment behind them and that they know we know how important their work is and that we make them better able to do their jobs. And so we will continue in the process of, adjust of going through and providing those cost of living adjustments. And it's been a wonderful example where the city and the nonprofit sector working together can really find efficiencies and savings that can fund these. We've had a wonderful collaboration with United Way, Human Services Council, and another, uh, a number of um, leading federations. Um, I saw Nancy Waxstein here this morning. She's been participating, Fatima Goldman. People are really working hard to find efficiencies so that we can find ways that we can even improve services save dollars, and get the money out to invest in our workforce. We're going to continue to do that. I, um, I will not let OMB take that money as budget savings. It's money that I insist that we're going to keep going into the sector. Some of you have started to get involved with the Mayor's Office um, of Contract Services um, in their um, technical assistance work that they're doing. This is, again, an effort to try to bring knowledge and support to the sector in order to understand how the, um, the management and technical structure of their organizations are, um, are how well poised they are to um, manage themselves into the future. And in this context, we're also going to continue our focus on outcomes and performance. And I think this is a really important point. I think now more than ever, we have to show that every dollar of spending, it ma that, that it matters more than ever and that we're producing outcomes um, that are serving our clients better than ever. 
It's not a time that, um, that we can retract from that. We have to, and in fact, I believe the more we do that, the more confidence we're going to get from the taxpaying public that has to support us ultimately that their dollars are being well spent. And I think it is time that more than ever that we can't tolerate waste and we can't tolerate sub-level performance. We really have to continue to expect the best of ourselves. And so the bottom line is that we have to really continue to make sure that the foundation is strong, um, that as we move into these tougher times, we're um, better poised to meet the needs of those that we serve, and, um, and that we continue to take risks and experiment and find those new solutions that are going to help us find um, better pathways out of poverty for people who um, we come into contact with. It's not just about shoring up the safety net. We have to make sure the safety net is strong, but we also have to think creatively and be willing to take risks. And so investing in the foundation, working together, we're not going to get the same kind of results um, if we become factionalized. We really have to be willing to sit down together and think and strategize and negotiate, um, demanding more of ourselves than others demand of us, and, um, and committing to our core um, our core, core strength. I think those are the critical message. And I think if we do that, we're going to get the confidence um, and the commitment that we need from the, gen from the public at large. And, and more and more, I think we'll see others in the city step up to help us in this mission. And so um, you have my commitment, um, the mayor's commitment, who believes strongly in the importance of keeping a strong not-for-profit sector. And, um, and I um, think that the tough times um, ahead of us really demand that we give it our best. So thank you.